Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the birdhouse and we are live. We've had a busy couple of weeks, so we haven't been live as much as usual. We've had different presentations and on-site presentations going on. So we are back live here today, though. Today is Saturday, April 22nd. It is our feeder cleaning day here at the store. If you've ever, ever participated in that, you know that is a lot of fun. We will take in your tube feeders and clean them for you and call you when they're done. So we've got that event going on today from 10 till 3. Um, and then it's also Earth Day. So happy Earth Day to everybody. As always, we love to know what kind of things you're seeing. You can put your sightings in the comments. It, we are getting into migration time. There's different birds coming into the area. So it's a very exciting time of the year. We love to know what kind of things you're seeing. So absolutely put your sightings in the comments. If you have any questions, you can throw those in there as well. And we'll get started. We'll be talking migration today, giving you an update about the things people are seeing and a little bit more. So let's get started here. Um, first of all, with it being spring, it is mason bee time. If you have a mason bee house that had been capped off, you'll probably be seeing those little bees emerging if you haven't already. I've noticed a lot of mine are out of the house. There's a few cells that looks like they still need to be um, chewed away and moved out. But for the most part, the mason bees are all hatching out. And mason bees are these little native bees. You don't need to do anything special to attract them as far as putting out any lures or anything like that. They are attracted to houses that have these little tubes in them. And the females will lay their eggs inside of here. So right now is when they're hatching out. And after a little bit, the females will start laying their eggs inside these houses again and starting the whole process over again where they'll cap off these little tunnels. But right now is when they're all emerging. So this is what they look like. There's different species, but these are the what the ones in my yard look like. They're little. They almost look like tiny little honey or uh, honeybees, but they're quite small. They really don't sting. Um, so they're very docile, they're solitary. So it's not like a big hive structure, like you think of honeybees or even wasps, how they have those big hives. They're solitaries and each female is her own queen, if you will. Each female lays her own eggs. So it's not like there's a queen bee. Each female bee will lay her own eggs inside of a house. And this is one of my houses from a couple years ago. I've re since replaced this one, but this is just showing kind of what it looks like when they're emerging. You can see here there's one, one of the little heads is popping out there. So they'll start chewing away at the little mud that's capped off these tunnels and then they'll emerge. So curious if you guys have seen mason bees in your yard. We have different houses. They don't need anything too elaborate. We've got these little houses like this. They have bamboo tunnels in them and then some little pieces of wood that have holes drilled in them for the bees to lay their eggs in. I've got one of these in my backyard. And then we've got them in different shapes and things too. Like this one's new. It says the bee barn and it's shaped like a barn and it has the little tunnels. And then recently, I, well, I've got some of these smaller ones. I also started replacing mine um, to ones like this where you can more easily replace the tubes. So some of the mason bee houses have little bamboo tubes like this which are fine, but they are glued in there. So when it comes time to replace them, you do have to kind of pry them out a little bit, which is fine. Um, but what I started doing is replacing mine with these. So this has an insert that you can easily just remove. So you can take this out. You can get a whole brand new insert if you want to, if you ever wanted to replace it, or you can just get the tubes. You can easily pull these tubes out. These tubes are actually cardboard which you wouldn't think would last very long, but they do because this does have a roof on it and it is shielded. And then if you want just tubes, we do have just the little replacement tubes that you can get to replace your in your Mason Bee house. So we've got all that going on right now. It's a perfect gift for a gardener, for somebody that has everything in their yard and you're trying to find something a little different for them. Mason Bee houses are a lot of fun and they're really great pollinators. So they pollinate early. So the things that are in bloom now are great for the pollinators. So, or for the mason bees, like the flowering trees, uh, fruit trees are another thing that they pollinate. So they'll be around for like six to eight weeks. We'll have the mason bees out and then they'll start to fizzle and we'll start to see more honeybees 
So last weekend, I spent a little bit of time outdoors, including camping on Saturday night. It was nice enough here to be outdoors. And I, for the first time, got to see what's called the uh, Woodcock courtship display. This is the American woodcock here. They're actually, they're a type of shorebird, but you can find them in wooded areas. And in the springtime, they do this elaborate mating ritual. So this sky dance, if you will, out in fields, especially if you can find a field that's surrounded by woods. If you listen at dusk, you can start to hear them making the sound that sounds like paint and they, they start to make this little buzzing kind of painting sound. And then I got to see one of them do this. It started to get too dark, I think, to see it more than once. Uh, but the males will start doing this elaborate spiral where, where they'll fly up into the air, into a spiral. Um, they're doing these big, big circles. And then they'll, they'll fly to the ground, sometimes in a zigzag pattern, in order to attract a female. So that's kind of a mating ritual that's going on right around now. And I was lucky enough to see that last weekend. So that was pretty exciting. So... If you're uh, in an area that does have any kind of open fields, especially if there's some some trees and woods around it, um, keep an eye out for that in the, the dusk hours. So pretty cool thing. And then there was also barred owl that were hooting out um, outside as well. So that was pretty neat as well. So those were my neat sightings um, over the past week. But the questions we're getting the most out of anything else is when are the Orioles coming? When are the hummingbirds coming? Um, I've been scouring eBird. I haven't seen any reports locally, at least here in the Rochester area of humming or of Orioles. But we have had a couple customers say that they've seen them and heard them. So while it is kind of early, they will start to be showing up any day now. So it's usually around the 24th of April or so we start to hear the first reports. So now is absolutely the time to put your feeders out because they will be here any day now. And we do have different Oriole feeders. Really the thing that attracts them the most is going to be the grape jelly. And we do have what's called birdberry jelly. And this is really popular. It's a mix of grape and blackberry, which is their absolute favorite. And there's no artificial sweeteners in here. There's no corn syrup, anything like that. So you want to make sure what you're feeding them is all natural, no dyes, nothing like that. So we've got a ton of birdberry jelly in for your Orioles. So now is absolutely the time to put those out. Early in the season, I do all of their favorite foods. So I do the, the jelly. Um, I'll put the oranges out like this picture shows here. This is a really popular feeder for the Orioles. You can stick oranges on it. There's a cup for the grape jelly. And they'll also drink nectar. So you can make your own nectar using sugar and water for the Orioles, or we have pre-made mixes. And we have things that you can just add water to to make your Oriole nectar. But you can use sugar and water to make your own. For the Orioles, the recipe is one part sugar to five parts water. Although some people just use their hummingbird recipe to attract the Orioles. They're not super picky. The recipe for the hummingbirds is one part sugar to four parts water. So it is sweeter. And we hear all the time that Orioles are trying to get into people's hummingbird feeders. So you could really just make up one big pitcher of nectar if you wanted to, to attract both. This is our best selling Oriole feeder, I would say. This is called the Oriole Fest. And the reason people like it so much, and the birds like it so much, is because it gives you spaces for all the Orioles' favorite foods. So on the top, there's these little compartments here for the jelly. And then in orange, you can spear right here on the little stem. And then inside, you can put the nectar. So the nectar goes inside this little dish. And what's great now is that it does come with what are called bee guards. Some feeders do have bee guards, which can help. I mean, you'll always have bees and wasps around, especially as the season goes on and the hives get bigger. You will have them around, but they can't really get into the feeders if they have bee and wasp guards on. And this does have bee guards on it for the nectar portion. And they're just these little rubber tips. Um, you pull one off and then they go on the feeding port here. So I'm not sure if you can see it, see it super well, but we have them for hummingbird feeders too that I'll show you. Um, but really what they do is it creates a barrier. So the rubber tip has little holes in it that the bird's beak can poke through, but the bees and wasps 
they can't do that. So it's one way to help keep the bees and wasps out. So this is called the Oriole Fest Feeder, and that's really our bestseller, but then people also like this one. So I thought I'd show this one off too. This one people like because it has two cups, so you can do lots of jelly, especially early in the season. But then as the season goes on, you might find you're not getting as many Orioles or they seem to disappear. That's pretty common. I get that myself too. So when that time comes, what a lot of people will do is put jelly in one cup and then put mealworms in the other. And when they're raising their young, they will go for lots of mealworms. So you, that's a good way to keep them coming all summer long. This also has a weather guard on it, which people like. So I'm not sure if you can see it very well there, but that's a clear weather guard to keep the rain out, especially for the jelly and the mealworms so they don't get all washed away. And it has these little pegs on it too for oranges. So just a couple of the different Oriole feeders that we have here at the store. We have a whole bunch more, but the Orioles will be here any day now. So it's really an exciting time of the year and we will let you know absolutely as soon as we hear that they're really flowing in. It's usually all on the same day. All of a sudden we'll start to get a bunch of phone calls that the Orioles have arrived. Same with humming hummingbirds. Now hummingbirds usually arrive a little bit after, but we've gotten several reports from people, including a couple of our staff members that have seen hummingbirds. So it is early and it's not the big push of birds that we will see in a couple of weeks, but people are already starting to see hummingbirds, which is probably the earliest I've ever heard. Um, again, I've been looking at eBird. I haven't seen any reports locally, but that doesn't mean that they're not here, especially if we have a lot of people saying that they've seen some. So I would absolutely put out your hummingbird feeder. Um, same thing like the Oriole. You can make your own nectar. We do have pre-made nectar. I use this from Sweet Seed. It's a ready to use super easy. You just pour it in your feeder. You don't have to worry about mixing anything. And then if you don't want to have to change your nectar out very often because you do want to change it every few days, we do have this product too called Nectar Defender, which is really popular. Instead of your, having to change your nectar every few days, if you put this in your feeder, you only have to change it every week or 10 days. So this is really popular. We have a whole bunch of this in stock. This is made specifically for hummingbird feeders. It doesn't hurt the hummingbirds in any way. Just some natural micronutrients that go in the nectar to keep it fresh longer. And we do have hummingbird feeders that have bee guards on them too. Any of these dishes like this by the Aspects Company, they're usually called humzingers. This one's called the Humzinger High View. Um, they, they have kind of some different looks to them, but any of these dish feeders, and you might have one already if, you, if you've been feeding hummingbirds before. If you open it up, look at the inside because if it has these little tips on the inside here, like these little projections that stick out, you can put bee guards on those. So you can see there's these little things that are, are sticking out of the, the feeder. We sell these nectar guard tips. They're little rubber tips. You pull one of those off and you put it on these projections like this. Again, same idea as with that Oriole feeder I was just showing you. The, the hummingbird can poke through these little rubber tips with, it, with its beak, but the bees and wasps can't. So really works well at keeping those bees and wasps away, especially as the season goes on. Early in the spring, it's really not that big of an issue. You might see a few of them around, but not a lot. But come say July, August, there tends to be quite a few of them around. We did start carrying a product too that is supposed to keep the wasps off the feeder. It's something that smells kind of like mint. Haven't tried it yet, but we'll keep you posted on that because if that works, that's gonna be a huge, uh, a, a huge problem solver for people. And then one other thing, if you have ants that are going after your, uh, your feeders, we do have these little cups called ant moats. These are super simple to keep your hummingbird feeders and oriole feeders free of ants. And how these work is you fill these with water and then you hang your feeder from it and the ants can't get around the water that's in here to get down to the feeder. And what I find with mine, I've got a, an ant mode that's a little bit bigger and it's clear, is that the goldfinches especially will use it as a little bird bath. So it's really fun. So it's kind of like a two for one type of thing with your um, with with your ant molts that the, the birds, especially goldfinches, will use this as a little bird bath. So really fun stuff. 
So Orioles are on their way. Hummingbirds are also on their way. It's any day now until we really hear about that big push that's coming through. Usually with Orioles, it's the last week of April, which we're getting into right now. And then with hummingbirds, it's usually that first week of May. And then come mid-May, they are really, really flying through in big, big numbers. So um, that being said, people have seen hummingbirds. We've gotten multiple reports of people seeing hummingbirds. And people have said that they've seen and heard Orioles. So uh, still early, but now is absolutely the time to get your feeders out. So a little fun thing to do this weekend. And so I pulled up, I was searching, like I said, I was searching eBird, looking for reports of Orioles and hummingbirds recently, uh, you know, lo locally and recently, but I couldn't find any, but I pulled up this other map. This is a hummingbird migration map that I found. And you can see that there has been somebody that spotted one in Rochester. It said that they were seen in Fairport. And we've gotten a report from Henrietta. Somebody saw one um, out in Chile. Somebody saw one. So there's kind of been some scattered reports. So definitely put out those hummingbird feeders. And then I like to check this site as well called Birdcast. And I should have pulled up the map from yesterday, but they they delete them uh, once the, the evening is over. Because last night going into today, there was more migration um, than this map shows. So we could even get more reports today of some of these migrants coming in. But I love to pull up the, these maps. This is something called BirdCast. And this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you just Google BirdCast, it will pop right up. This is using weather data, Doppler data, to predict how many birds are going to be flowing into the area. They can use weather patterns. They kind of predict. Uh, what the bird migration is going to be for certain evenings because these songbirds will migrate overnight. So they migrate overnight and that's why they're so active in the early mornings. They've been flying all night. They need to eat in the super early in the morning and then they kind of hunker down for the day just to continue on their migration. So this is the predicted migration for this evening for tonight going into tomorrow. So it's not super high in our area, at least where, where I am right now in upstate New York here. But if you look down in Texas and in Florida, you can see that there is a push of migrants coming through. So it's only a matter of time before they start coming up to our area. So that being said, while it doesn't look like a lot, there's still 80 million birds predicted to be flowing into the the U.S. So you can see over the next couple of days, there should be some pretty good migration and give it a couple of weeks and we'll have more of this yellow color. So the, the brighter the color, the brighter yellow the color is, the more migration you have going through your area. So we're getting there and uh, we'll keep you updated about everything that people are seeing, uh, all the birds people are seeing and, and everything else. So that being said, we're talking about backyard birds that you might be seeing that are migratory. We talked about Orioles and hummingbirds. Another one to be on the lookout for, especially once you start seeing those Orioles, are the rose-breasted grosbeaks. And these are related to cardinals. So if you have a feeder right now that you're getting cardinals at, you most likely can get the rose-breasted grosbeaks. They're large like a cardinal is. They like the same foods. If you see, if you look at their beak, they've got that same beak that the cardinal does. So rose-breasted grosbeaks will be flowing into the area soon. The males being black and white with that bright red breast. And then the females almost look like an oversized purple finch or house finch. Um, we had some pictures of purple finch come in. I'll show you in just a moment um, that Bob sent in. And the rose-breasted grosbeak kind of looks like a female purple finch, at least the female rose-breasted grosbeak looks like a female purple finch but she's going to have a much bigger bill. So look at that bill size. They've got a nice big, big bill like a cardinal does. So they like sunflower seed. They like safflower seed. They like feeders with big open perches, just like the cardinals do. So if you've got a tray feeder, that is ideal for the rose-breasted gross beaks. Last year, I was getting them chowing away on my safflower logs. They love the safflower just like cardinals do. So keep an eye out for those. I'd love to hear. Um, when you get those, let us know, absolutely. Something to look out for underneath your feeders or sometimes at your feeders 
are going to be chipping sparrows. This was a photo sent in by Bob of a chipping sparrow. In the winter, we get what are called American tree sparrows, which look a lot like chipping sparrows, but the tree sparrows are larger and they have a stripe through their eye that is chestnut colored. Um, and the chipping sparrow is smaller and has a stripe that goes through its eye that's black. So keep an eye out for chipping sparrows. I just saw my first one last week, um, actually out at Lollipop Farms on their feeders there, there was a little chipping sparrow. So the tree sparrow, which is larger and similar looking is more of a winter bird. So they're on their way out and the chipping sparrows are on their way back in. So keep an eye out for them. And on the nesting front, we're getting lots of reports of birds nesting. So they are looking for places to nest. It's not too late to put out a nesting box. Um, the first time I tried to attract bluebirds, I didn't get a nesting box out until Labor Day weekend, which was kind of late, but I still was able to get some nesting. So it's not too, too late, but I would absolutely put your nesting boxes out if you haven't already. If you're starting to see nest site competition, so if your nesting box, say you wanted to get bluebirds and you're getting sparrows in it, you can always add an additional nest box to help alleviate some of that competition between species. We've been hearing reports of um, chickadees nesting, chickadees checking out boxes, wrens coming back into the area and singing their little hearts out at nesting sites. And then this photo was sent in by Bob, who's been having bluebirds nesting in his nesting box. He's been keeping us posted on this. He says, final bluebird egg count is four and mama is incubating quite a bit now. So bluebirds generally have anywhere between three and five eggs which eat with each brood. And the more, usually the more mature the female is, so the older the, the female is, she tends to have more eggs. Although that being said, it can have to do with the resources. If there's scarce resources, if there's not a lot of insect material out there, um, sometimes that counts lower. So looks like Bob's bluebird has four eggs. So we'll have to keep tabs on that and see how that goes. So exciting time of the year. He also sent in these photos of, here's these purple finches I was talking about in comparison to the rose-breasted grosbeaks. Um, here are some purple finches. People have been getting purple finches, house finches. Um, so they are definitely out. Here is a female purple finch. Looks similar to that rose-breasted grosbeak female, but she doesn't have that big, big bill like the grosbeak will. Um, so lots of fun birds out there right now. Here's another picture of <clears throat> a pair of purple finches here. And this is a good photo because you can see some of the compare you can see what makes it a purple finch they don't have the males don't have as many stripes on them as the house finch does so if uh, i had a super super bright red house finch in the yard the other day and it made me do a double take because i thought oh that might be a purple finch but it wasn't um the house finches do males do still have a lot of brown on them lots of stripes but if you look at this male purple finch here you can see there's not a lot of stripes on its breast so Male, female, purple finch. A lot of the birds are starting to pair up. I've been getting house finches in pairs, male, female pairs, a couple pairs each day. So birds are definitely starting to pair up and form those, those bonds. Uh, birds of prey, definitely birds of prey around. We're getting lots of reports of bald eagle, lots of bald eagles out there. Red-tailed hawk, here's a nice photo of a red-tailed hawk that Bob sent in. It's like a very dark colored red-tailed hawk. Cooper's hawks, people are still getting Cooper's hawks in their yards, sharp chin hawks also, but you'll probably start to see less as they get, uh, as their, their prey becomes less scarce. So as there's more uh, small mammals out there, snakes are coming out of hibernation, um, amphibians are coming out of their hibernation or their, their torpor, I guess I should say. Um, so as more and more food items are available, probably won't see these coming to your feeders as often as you were in the uh, winter months. But Cooper's hawks are still out there. They're here all year round out of Braddock Bay. They are in the middle of the hawk migration. Next weekend is actually Bird of Prey Days out at um, Braddock Bay, which is really fun. And um, that will be next weekend, Saturday, Sunday. So um, that's out here in Rochester. 
This is another photo that was sent in. This is an Eastern Phoebe, which is a type of flycatcher, another migratory bird that comes through the area. Um, this was sent in by Bob in his backyard, a little Eastern Phoebe there. And their call sounds like they're saying their name. It sounds like they're saying Phoebe over and over. And this is an Eastern Toey. So this is another bird to look for underneath your feeders. Um, some people get them in the winter time, but they're really more common here in the spring and in the summer months. And they are in the sparrow family. So sometimes you can see them at your feeders or underneath the feeders. And this was sent in by Bob who says, not great shots, but it was dusk and he wasn't close close by, but the Eastern Toeys are here. I heard him and then had to search around the area until I found him. He was sitting on a branch singing away. So this is an Eastern Toey. Their call sounds like they're saying, drink your tea. Um, so they've got a very distinctive call. And here's, I love this photo here of the Toey. It's singing its little heart out here. So this is a great photo that was sent in by Bob of an Eastern Toey. So really, really cool. Birds sometimes are called rufous-sided towies because if you look at the, the side of its body, it's kind of that chestnut brownish, orangish color. Um, northern flickers. So this well, here's a picture of a northern flicker here sent in by Bob. Lots of woodpecker activity. People are getting lots of pileated woodpeckers, um, downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers. They're all excavating their nests. Uh, their nest sites. I love the, these photos here that Mark sent in. He says, female northern flicker cleaning out and preparing for nesting and Erie Canal Lock 32. They had a nest in the same tree last year, but a different hole this time. So here's a picture of the northern flicker. And then here's an action shot of it excavating its nesting site. So they will make their own holes to nest and then uh, they'll they'll use them to lay their eggs inside and then usually other birds will use them the next year or after the woodpeckers are done so uh, woodpeckers are considered primary primary uh, cavity cavity nesters where they will make the the hole themselves and then following years you might get even a bluebird in in that nesting cavity you might get a chickadee, depending on the hole size. If it's big enough, you could even get a screech owl or a kestrel. So some other nesting activity going on. Osprey, so talking about different birds of prey that are coming into the area. Um, osprey are a migratory bird of prey. We don't have them here in the winter. They like open water. They are fish eaters. So if you look by large bodies of water, you might just find osprey. They are quite large, so they can be uh, mistaken for bald eagle sometimes because their head is quite white as well, but their their wings are going to be longer and thinner, so they're not as robust, I would say, as the bald eagles are. And then this is a fun set of photos here. Kingfisher getting chased by the red-winged blackbird at Kingsman Park. So this was sent in by Mark, who looks like the uh, red-winged blackbird is chasing that kingfisher. Maybe the kingfisher got too close to the red-winged blackbird's nesting site. And then some other bird on bird activity here. Uh, there's another series of photos from Mark who says, Blue Jay pestering the red-tailed hawk at the Erie Canal. Hawk said enough and off it went. So here's a very bold blue jay going after a red-tailed hawk. And it looks like the blue jay won because then the red-tailed hawk flew away. Um, another migratory bird coming into the area. We um, heard some reports of golden crown kinglets. There's also ruby crown kinglets. So this is a little ruby crown kinglet, small bird. Uh, people see these guys hopping around in little in trees and bushes. And usually you'll see these before the warblers. So if you're seeing something right now that's small, hopping around in a bush pretty quickly, could very well be a kinglet. And this is a ruby crown kinglet. We also have golden crown kinglet in the area. Uh, but you can see how it gets its name here. It's got that little ruby patch on the top of its head, which isn't always visible. So they can be really hard to identify sometimes because they're just a very kind of plain colored bird. So ruby crown kinglet photo here sent in by Mark. Um, another photo sent in by him is a barn swallow. So barn swallows also migratory. We've been seeing tree swallows and tree swallows 
activity coming back to the area and nesting in bluebird houses and, and open fields. And then barn swallows, you can usually find nesting on structures. So barns, um, they will nest sometimes in uh, under bridges. So if you ever see a bunch of swallows flying around a bridge, probably barn swallows in our area, they've got that forked tail, which you can see really well in this photo here, which the tree swallows do not have, but that is a barn swallow coming back to the area. And finally, we're getting into some of our early spring warblers are coming back. And this is one of our earliest spring warble warblers that comes back to the area. Every once in a while, people get these coming to their bird feeders, especially if you have something that has sunflower hearts or mealworms in it. This is a pine warbler. It's a yellowish colored bird with uh, white bands on its wings. So this is the pine warbler. And these are some photos sent in by Mark, who saw one at Men and Ponds Park. And another warbler photo he sent in is another early migrating warbler, yellow rumped warbler, one of our more common species you can find here. And if you get it at the right angle, you can see it's got a little yellow patch on its back there. So yellow rumped warbler. And to round it off, this is a neat photo of a bird that we do have here all year, but they're more secretive. You don't see them around all too much. They are usually raised and released, although there are some that um, do nest naturally in the area that have gotten naturalized. This is a ring-necked pheasant. They like open grassland type of areas. So if you've got a lot of uh, bluebird type of habitat, you might just find some ringneck pheasant. Um, but this was another photo sent in by Mark who said spotted a ringneck pheasant at Kings Bend Park. It was a really fun sighting to see. It looks like it's on a railroad track or something right there. So a couple photos here of a ringneck pheasant. So something you don't see all the time. And that is everything I have as far as updates go. We will, of course, keep you posted about different sightings of hummingbirds and orioles and rose-breasted grosbeaks. So if you've seen any, definitely let us know in the comments. It looks like there are some people on. Um, Randy is on and saying, hi, Liz, and every birdie I ship says hello. Um, Bob, who had the uh, some of the photos that were sent in, including that bluebird nest photo, said had about 10 to 12 white-throated sparrows under my feeders this morning. That was a first for so many. So white-throated sparrows, keep an eye out for them then. That's a cool sighting. So you never know what will show up underneath your bird feeders this year or this time of the year. White-throated sparrows, white-crowned sparrows, chipping sparrows. So lots of different sparrows, including that toki, which is a type of sparrow also. Um, Ed is on and says about a dozen of our mason bee house tubes were filled until about two weeks ago when I noticed they were all empty. It's two years old, so I decided to replace the tubes, but I was too late. When I checked yesterday, once again, about a dozen tubes were filled and there's a lot of activity around the house. Kind of exciting, but I guess I have to wait till next April to change out the tubes. Yep, you might have to. It looks like they, they beat you to it there. They started using it. Um, Steel Monkey says, nickname the cutthroat. I think that's about the rose-breasted gross beak. Uh, we were talking about different migrants coming in and be on the lookout for rose-breasted gross beak. And I've never heard this one before, so that's something new. Nickname the cutthroat, rose-breasted gross beak. Kind of cool. Um, Bob says, Mama Bluebird is still incubating and should have babies the end of next week, hopefully. Yes. So soon these eggs will hatch. It doesn't take too long. I think it's like 10 to 12 days sometimes. It's it's not very long from incubation, incubation time until they hatch. Stacy is on and says, can tell it's spring when the northern, northern flicker has been drilling on our metal chimney guard bright and early most mornings. Whew, yeah, we've been getting lots of calls about that, that woodpeckers are drumming or, you know, knocking on the side of very loud things, usually people's homes. Um, that's one way that they will say that that is their territory. They're, they're trying to attract mates. They're trying to establish themselves in a certain area. And unfortunately, they do that by sometimes pecking on things that are very, very loud. So you might hear that. Um, usually very early in the morning also, which is, uh, it can be a little frustrating. Um, Steel Monkey says, I have a brown-headed cowbird here on Cape Cod who's making a mess of my feeders. He won't go away. So brown-headed cowbirds are a type of blackbird. They are in that blackbird family. 
So if you're looking for a type of seed that they won't eat, they don't like the safflower seed. So that's that white um, seed that's will go into a sunflower seed feeder, a sunflower mix feeder. Uh, so that is the safflower seed it's called that'll fit into your mix seed feeder. Don't mix it with anything, just do straight safflower and that should keep them away. People have mixed feelings about brown-headed cowbirds. They are a native species, but they're also what's called a nest parasite. So they'll lay their eggs into the nests of other birds and then those birds but raise their their children. So uh, people have mixed feelings about brown-headed cowbirds, but another interesting species we have in the area as well as Cape Cod. So it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions. We'll be back soon to give you updates about migratory birds, what's coming into the area and what you can do to attract them better. So definitely be on the lookout. We've got all kinds of events going on at the store. We've got a full calendar events of events here at the birdhouse, including our first ever bird watching cruises, which the first one completely sold out very quickly, but we still have two dates available. Um, those are birding cruises on the Erie Canal via the Sam Patch Boat. You can get tickets for those by going onto our website, which is thebirdhouseny.com and clicking on events. One is on July 27th and the other is August 17th. So we still have some spots open for those if you are interested. So that's everything for the day. We will be back soon and until then have a great weekend and